I've had the pleasure of knowing Timnit Gibru since she was a PhD candidate at Stanford and gave an excellent talk at our Stanford Institute ICME. She is one of the most thoughtful and interesting speakers I've ever met. Her work on biases in facial recognition software is seminal and really has inspired many others to investigate biases and ethics related to data science and AI. She shared her work in this WIDS Tech Talk from the conference in 2019. Since that time, Timnit has done excellent work regarding a multidisciplinary approach to AI to ensure that AI solutions are designed to work for all of us. She is truly a pioneer in the field, and I know we will continue to follow her closely in the future. Oh, two slides. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, and then today I'll talk about what's wrong with my work that I talked about uh, <laughs> when I was a student with Google Street View Images, um, or what, what could potentially be wrong. Um, okay, so a lot of people have basically covered some of the things I want to talk about today, which is... Um, data and like how we don't think about data and how there is bias in um, uh, uh, the data that we collect, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the kind of stuff I want to talk about today. And so as we know, since everybody is data scientist, that AI is everywhere. I don't know what I mean by AI at this point because I, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I hope we all kind of understand each other. But um, and I'm not talking about this, you know? You know, this is like the more glamorous kind of robots. And I, I should name my talk as like the less glamorous aspects of our work. And so what I mean is, you know, um, just data-driven uh, decisions and predictive models that are making decisions about many things, right? So we're using it to um, control our power systems, our water systems, and um, <laughs> driving systems. And this company loves me right now because I talk about them all the time. I got contacted by their PR people, um, HireVue, which now has, I believe, a, a panel of ethicists um, because both Joy and I keep on using them as example. Um, so has anybody heard about HireVue? So I have nothing against HireVue. Um, uh, so it's a company that <clears throat> uses um, Basically, if you have lots and lots of resumes, and um, instead of having you know um, people, thousands of recruiter, uh, recruiters sifting through thousands of resumes, they have automated tools that do this, right? And decide who should come for an interview versus not. So in theory, I think this is probably a good idea because you know it, it, people have different biases. You might not, you might miss you know, certain groups of people who uh, should be interviewed versus not. <clears throat> and so what HireVue says is that the companies that have used them have actually been able to have more diverse groups of people being interviewed. But we, we can't verify this claim, right? We don't know whether this is true or not. HireVue has over 600 companies around the world, ranging from huge companies like Nike and a whole bunch of other companies like nonprofits, um, educational um, bodies, the UAE government uses HireVue, I found out. And every day I find out more about like um, who uses them. And in addition to this automated tool that they have, they now have another, um, another tool that actually videotapes you while you're being interviewed. Has anybody gone through this? Every time I give this talk, there's somebody in the audience who actually was um, video recorded with um, HireVue during their interview. You did, see? Exactly, okay. <laughs> Can you tell us about your experience? Oh, yeah, you can tell us. Okay, so they did tell you that they were going to record you. Mm -hmm. um, a bunch of behavioral questions, um, which I was supposed to answer, and that I think that was pretty much it. Okay, <laughs> so so they did tell you they were going to record you. Some people yeah. said that they didn't sign any consent forms and they didn't know that they were being recorded, etc. So, did you know that um, there was emotion recognition software being applied to your? face and being analyzed. Sorry, can you say that again? That emotion recognition tools were being, you know, I don't know, they were analyzing your emotions. Or I don't know. So it was on my laptop and my ah. webcam was on. Um, and I think they were just videotaping me. Yeah. And then they would do some analysis later on, I guess. Later on, they did some analysis. And we, again, don't know what that analysis is. But because I've been on a whole bunch of panels, I found out that they use um, Affectiva. 
uh, emotion, um, emotion um, recognition software. So, 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 and so what they advertise is that they give the customers verbal and nonverbal cues about your interview. So in addition to what you're saying, now there's nonverbal cues. Um, and so, you know, in theory, this might all be okay, but the point I want to make here is that we're using all of these tools everywhere. This is employment. This is someone's ability to get a job anywhere in the world, 600 companies, and we don't know what kind of software is being used, what its characteristics are. We don't have any regulation. Um, and so this is basically the only point I'm trying to make, right? And it might all be just fine and good, but we don't know. And so we should investigate more. Um, I didn't mean to spend so much time on higher view. Um, so anyways, the whole, <laughs> the whole point of my slides is that, you know, there's all sorts of places, high stakes scenarios where um, these data driven algorithms are being used. And of course, uh, if you would like to learn more, there is weapons of math destruction and automated inequality where they did a good job of kind of um, talking about these things um, for a general audience, right? And so I started getting interested in this when, um, or getting scared when I found out for the first time um, with a, this 2016 ProPublica article that there were these, um, there was a, com a company that was, um, uh, saying that they can predict someone's likelihood of predi uh, c committing a crime again, and that judges were actually using this software to, as one of many inputs to determine how many years someone should go to prison for. Right, so now this is where someone's lived experience comes in, right? I'm a black woman in the US, I have had encounters with police, and I know, like, I know the ways in which this could be biased. And so that immediately got me really, really nervous. Um, another uh, thing that where my lived experience comes into play is the fact that I'm a refugee. And so I just signed a letter last year um, against something called the Extreme uh, Vetting Initiative that was proposed by ICE, where they were proposing to analyze social network data, someone's social network data, to determine various things like, will you be a good citizen? Are you likely to be a terrorist, et cetera? Right? And so here's a few questions. One is, should we do this, period? And two is, are our tools that we have right now to analyze social network data um, robust enough to even do this kind of thing? So let's talk about number two. So here is um, an example where someone wrote, good morning, and it was translated to attack them. And, um, and the person got arrested, and then he was later let go. Right, so there's two things here. One is, you know, English to Arabic translation, or um, I'm sorry, Arabic to English translation. Um, it, it probably, the same uh, error probably would not have happened if it was like English to French translation, right? So it's a question of like, what kind of languages we focus on, you know, what kind, who are the people who are most represented in, um, in, in this group of people working on language translation, and who is it most likely to be used against, right? Um, and so, the, 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 but the fourth thing is automation bias. This, this, this tendency that we have to just trust that the translation is, 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 was, was probably right, right? People didn't check to see the original, what was originally written. And so, Ayanna Howard at Georgia Tech does really interesting research on automation bias. For example, um, they showed that like, um, students would just follow a robot um, to a, towards a burning building towards smoke, like, you know, you know that towards clear things that were clearly wrong, right? Like a path that, you know, was, was there was a couch there or something like that. And the, the only time that they would stop is when um, it would just go across, by a window and just stand there. And you clearly, you know, what are you trying to tell me to do, right? Um, so this is automation bias, right? So we, we should... Um, not 100% trust um, that, that certain automated tools are making um, the right decisions. Okay, another thing I wanna talk about is, you, um, you might have heard about this. Um, um, Tolga, Adam Kalai, James Zhao, a whole bunch of people, they're different places now. Adam is in Microsoft Research, Tolga is at Google, James Zhao is here at Stanford. They did this work showing um, bias and word embeddings. Have, ha, who has um, heard about this work? 
A lot of people. Well, okay, I'll, I'll discuss it very briefly. So word embeddings are, are kind of a space where you can imagine um, words that are deemed to be similar are closer in the space than words that are uh, deemed to be different. So you can use word embeddings to generate analogies. So for example, you have man is to king as woman is to? <laughs> Queen. Okay, um, he's to brother as she's to? He's to doctor as she's to? Oh, this audience, <laughs> see, we, we are all, we all have these issues. Why should it be nurse, right? She, he's to doctor, she's to doctor, right? And so we are encoding, so this word embedding was trained with textual data. I believe it was Google News or some other thing, but we're encoding these kinds of societal biases in these word embeddings. So you might, you might wonder, you know, why do we care? It's like word embedding is some random uh, little tool that you're talking about. Why do we care about this? Well, you can imagine, let's say we're talking, I was telling you about automated tools to look through resumes, right? So imagine you have two different resumes, okay? One is, um, and you imagine you're looking for someone who is a computer uh, scientist. Uh, or a software engineer, right? So you can look, you can imagine looking at a word embedding and trying to see um, who has skills that are close to a software engineer. So, you know, Java, Python, C++, SQL, et cetera. So you have two resumes that are exactly the same. One has, you know, but one is a quarterback at the University of Vermont. Another one is software team captain at Spelman, right? So second one is, you know, Spelman is like an HBCU, um, a softball, mostly women play this sport, and so pr probably this person is a black woman, and then the prior person is a white male. So now if you have that this the white guy is closer in the word embedding to a computer programmer than the, the black woman, then you have inadvertently created a, a system that is now discriminating against um, black women, right? And so you could be breaking equal employment opportunity laws right now at the moment, but you don't know, and none of us know. So this is just the point I was trying to make. Another thing I want to talk about is, so that was textual data. Let's talk about um, visual data. So um, the, there is something called the perpetual lineup report that I recommend everybody reads if you have time. They show that one in two American adults is in law enforcement um, database, and they can, look it up whenever they want, they can use it however they want, there's no standards on what kind of database it should be, et cetera, et cetera. Now, everybody has probably heard about this Google uh, images fiasco, right, where um, a certain, um, a black couple was being um, uh, recognized, as, I mean, classified as gorillas. Um, so why are these things, again, besides the fact that it's offensive, why is it, why is it relevant? Well, so I did some research with um, Joy Bolomini. She was um, the main author of this work, where we showed that the error rates of face recognition, I mean, the, specifically here we used, um, we looked at gender classification, which is you just look at an image and they tell, these systems tell you whether this image cons consists of a man or a woman, just binary. Uh, they don't handle any sort of other identities, and this was the simplest kind of uh, tool that we could look at to, to do some analysis. And we could see that the error rates um, were higher and higher and higher as you go by darker and darker and darker in skin type, right? So binary, like binary classification, the, the um, a, a coin flip is like 50%, right? So if you just guess, it's 50%. So you go, as you get to the darkest person, you're approaching 50% chance. And so if you didn't look at, you know, if you didn't try to break it down by gender and skin type, et cetera, the overall accuracy would be like 93%, 87%, you know, ship it, right? <laughs> Let's ship it. But um, we created a data set which was more balanced by gender and skin type, and then we saw those um, results that I'm telling you. Now, everybody's been talking about data. Why is this important? The first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to look at whether we can use existing data to do our analysis, right? Why, let's just break it down. Let's look at existing data, break it down by gender, by skin type, and see how these um, commercial APIs do by these different demographics. But we couldn't do that because even though people have been working on face recognition forever, 
all of the data that we could find was heavily skewed, right? So lighter skinned, um, overwhelmingly lighter skinned, and overwhelmingly male. So we had to create our own data set to do this analysis. Um, so I want to kind of close by saying we don't know what kind of biases we're propagating. It's not that we're trying to be evil or discriminate against certain groups of people. It's that we don't have things in place that are um, preventing us from doing these things. Um, and so I will tell you all the solutions now, because I know all of them. <laughs> if I was a guy, that's what I would say. <laughs> but I don't, I don't sorry. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> no. <laughs> I have some ideas, some ideas uh, that may or may not work. Now there's dis disclaimers, and, you know. Okay, so there's a bunch of people who work on, you know, some technical solutions. So uh, on, the, on the model side, and, and that's not what I'll talk about today. Um, one thing I want to say is we can't ignore social and structural problems. We can't just go in a, in a corner and write some code and read math and then we're, that's, that's the solution, right? We can't do that. So we have to think about who is being affected by these algorithms. And we have to think about um, uh, what these models can be used for. And we need standards and documentation. So um, again, I told you that we could be breaking existing laws right now. We don't know. Um, and so other industries have been there, right? So first is electronics, which is where I come from, uh, my former background, where we have this concept of a data sheet that talks about non-idealities and things like that for each component. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it a lot, but so um, I think we need data sheets for models and for, for data sets to discuss non-idealities, to discuss what it can and cannot be used for, the data distribution, et cetera. So, um, we came up with this paper called Data Sheets for Data Sets, and then recently Model Cards for Model Reporting that flushes out this idea a little bit more. Um, again, we need more standardization bodies, we need more laws, and we need more regulation. Um, so I wanted to talk about other industries. So the automobile cars, when they first came on the road, there were no stop signs, there were no drivers, like licenses, there was you know, no laws against drunk driving, you didn't need a license, you, could, uh, you didn't need to wear seat belts, and it was only late, way, way later that seat belts were legislated, right? And then they were doing these crash tests with prototypical male dummies. And so now we found that, um, that accidents, car accidents were overwhelmingly killing women and children, right? And so, we are sort of doing a similar thing here in our training data where we're not representing certain groups of people. And now look, when we're talking about self-driving cars, et cetera, there was just a paper that came out that showed that state-of-the-art object detection systems, uh, pedestrian detection systems, do um, have higher error rates for darker-skinned people, again, right? And so we can be just propagating all of these things that we've seen in other industries. <coughs> Excuse me. This was very funny for me because there was a question on whether it was inherently evil, right? That's the kind of discussion we're having on AI right now. Um, I'm going to skip through uh, critical clinical trials, but it took many years for other industries to come uh, to come up with standards, and we don't want to spend that much time in our industry to come up with standards. Um, so we should learn from other industries, and that's that's all I want to say. <laughs> Thank you.